I'm Dr. Randall Smith, and for about the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of traveling the lands of Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, and Italy, as we've been exploring the lands of the Bible. For about the last decade, we've been putting these kinds of journeys on tape, and you'll see now notebooks in hands of students in all of these countries as they begin to study how the places affect our understanding of the Bible. We hope in this series you'll be able to pick up some of that excitement as you see the archaeology and the history and the geography and as it comes together for your understanding of what the Bible meant to the people that originally experienced God in the text. Thanks for joining us again in this Israel part of our series on exploring the lands of the Bible. I want to take you today to a, a hillside overlooking the coastland of Tel Aviv. From these hillsides, there used to be vast forests in the biblical period. Many of them have been cut down, but, but today you can see that sweeping openness. Those forests were the place of, of Samson and Delilah, the, the stories of David and Goliath. We're going to sit at a place called Neot Kedumim and learn about the background of the Bible. We're going to look at what the biblical writer thought was obvious to you because in his time it was all very obvious, but with time passing, maybe we don't know exactly the same things. We're calling this, They Thought You Knew. We hope you enjoy spending time together with us as we together explore the lands of the Bible. In the biblical period, the, the normal greeting that we read about in the Bible, you see it particularly if an angel shows up. What are the words that they say when an angel appears in the Bible? Fear not. Usually fear not because if somebody appears that you're not expecting, you're afraid. But right after that, it'll say peace be unto you. In 1868, when Charles Warren came here under the Palestine Exploration Fund, there was a hand motion that went along with the words. It went something like this, peace be unto you. And what your hand is saying is, my heart is yours, my lips are yours, my mind is yours, I have no weapon in my hand, and I bow in trust before you. That's what your motions are saying. Do you ever talk to somebody and you got the feeling they were talking, but they were actually thinking about somebody that was behind you? Okay, this is, when we greet, we say, peace be unto you. And even today, if you see an OPEC summit with Arabs getting off a plane, they do something like this. This is a recalling of this. So I'll say, peace be unto you, and you'll reply, and unto you, peace. Okay, let's try it. Peace be unto you. And unto you, peace. Not too bad, but there are no ears in it, okay? <laughs> All right, then you greet one another with a holy kiss. All right, there's a difference between a holy and an unholy kiss. Not only at GCBI, but in the Bible, there's a difference, okay? You would keep the bodies separated. You would greet someone on the street, say, peace be unto you. They'd say, and unto you, peace. You put your hand extended on their opposite shoulder, kiss just to their cheek on each side, and then they return the favor. There are four kisses. Would you greet the people on either side of you now? You gotta stand up, you gotta stand up. You can't do it sitting down. Peace be unto you and... <laughs> <laughs> okay, some of you are enjoying this too much. We need to move on. Okay, the idea what we want to do is we want to, we want to take you from the world you came from, peel you out of your airplane seat, shake off all of your 21st century you, and put on the skin of a biblical person. To do that, you need to leave where you're from and come here. You need to take your mind and move it to here. All of the feasts and festivals will regard the land cycle here. Are the Jews a people, a race, a land, a book? There's some of all of those. And for you to understand their world, you've got to pour yourself into that world. 
I want to tell you before we go the very simplest story of the Bible. Obviously, I'm Christian, so I'm going to t tell it from a Christian perspective. It is nothing more or less than a, a love story of two marriages. God, who made heaven and earth in the beginning of the Bible, fell in love with a people and throughout time and history has decided that he would have an everlasting love for a people. And for a time, because that people has pulled itself away and turned its heart cold, for a time he set that people aside to come back to them later. But not until he had a son. And that son also came and fell in love and also chose a bride. And the bride of the son is to be an example of the to the estranged bride of the father, to turn her heart back to him. At the end of the Bible, this bride of the son is taken away by the son. A, a seven hard year period follows for the estranged bride of the father. And finally, she bows her head in trust. And the end of the Bible is the father gathers together this one that he has loved with an everlasting love. You are in the midst of her. You are a bride of the son in the land of the bride of the father. That's what we're doing here. That's the Christian story of the Bible. Now, for those of you who are Bible teachers, I just massacred that, okay? But I did it for a reason. I want you to be able to see that the biblical story is a love story, but it's a story set in a real place. I didn't realize it because I was probably the age of most of these students here when I first moved here. And when I went back a few years ago, I began to realize that it came about Christmas time and I was driving down the road and I was listening to uh, someone talk about the Christmas story on the radio and it sounded like the beginning of Star Wars, long ago and far away in a galaxy far beyond. It sounded unreal. The Bible is set in a real place. It's real people with a real setting. There's a valley that splits between that hill and this hill. That valley represents a break in the people of God and ten tribes to the north, that confederation that wasn't won over by Solomon's son and seceded from the Union and Samaria pulled out or, or the Ephraimite mountains, everything to the north pulled away from Judah and there was a fracturing and, and, and 19 evil kings and there's a story but it's set in a real place. What's important to me is this. I want you to begin to think that when you open up the pages of your Bible, you leave where you're from. You leave the things that are familiar to you. In the biblical world, they are living on the edge of survival. You live in a world of convenience. You get upset if you can't have your burger your way. For them, they, most people in the Bible knew what it meant at some point in the year to be hungry. For the people of the Bible, they didn't have all of the luxuries and conveniences and they didn't think in those terms. It took five people all year agriculturally planting. It took five people to harvest enough for six people to eat. That meant if your whole family worked together and worked hard, you probably would eat enough this year and have a little bit of something you could trade in the marketplace. We live in unprecedented prosperity. We live with an incredible, our poor people are rich. And so it's hard for us to project back into the time of the Bible. Remember, there's only three, different, three ways to get water in the ancient biblical world. You can dig all the way down to an underground river, to an aquifer. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has underground rivers, but you've got to work pretty hard to get to them and you'll make a well. Or you can carve a cistern and you can wait for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to send you rain and it'll come from the rain place, the water place, down and into your cistern. But both the cistern and the well take a lot of work. Remember we talked about Jeremiah 2. You traded the waters of the springs of God for cisterns. Sometimes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is so good, he brings the water right to the surface. I don't have to do anything, it's just there. You traded the, the, the running of what God gave you on the surface for the work of your hands and that's always broke. You're not going to earn his love. You don't have to work to become 
acceptable to him. That's not how it works. He brings what you need. You take from him. For a moment, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the background of the Bible itself. The Bible is not a book. The Bible is seven different kinds of literature put together in a library, and it's a work over a, a 16 to 1800 year period with more than 40 authors. But it has in common some biblical life shared value experiences that are different than ours. Let me say it this way. There are a lot of things the biblical writer thought were obvious to you, but they might not be obvious to you if you didn't grow up in his neighborhood doing what he did. And the very first one was form versus function. To the biblical writer, you are what you do. Hebrew is a, a functional language, which means this. When you study the Hebrew language, you can learn the nouns fairly quickly. It's the verbs that are a problem. There are so many verb tenses. And in the ancient structure of the language, you would say it like this, ran John to the store. The most important thing wasn't who did it, it wasn't who had it done to them. It was what was the action. The action moves the entire story. So for a biblical person, you are what you do. You are what your function is. And frankly, in, our, in the history of mankind, for many people, they got their, what we would call their last name, today by what their function was. My last name's Smith. So somewhere, somewhere in the line, there might have been somebody who did that trade. The important thing is for the biblical writer, they define themselves not by what they look like, but by what they do. So your character was defined by your actions, a very James-like look at things. How can you say you believe this, but do that? That doesn't make sense to a biblical world person. God in the Bible defines himself very, very differently. Let, let me set this up by saying I came to this subject by almost getting married once by accident. I was about 19 years of age. I was a student here in Jerusalem. And um, I had, because I was making some money and working in uh, archaeology of the basement of a building we're going to see later on in the tour, I, I was making a little bit of money. If you're 19 and you're making money, you don't clean. You hire someone to clean. So I got a, uh, a woman from El Azaria, uh, the village of Lazarus, can you hear his name, El Azaria? Bethany, and I, I hired a woman to come in and clean. Now, she was about five foot tall and about five foot wide, okay? And she was an Arab woman, and she spoke about three words of English, and one of them was move. And when she said, you move, you move. So she would show up, knock on my door, and say, move, and I would get out. And she brought her 14-year-old uh, daughter with her to do the floors and do the cleaning, and I was standing out on the roof in Jerusalem uh, overlooking the Dome of the Rock. It was late in the afternoon. And the 14-year-old girl came out. She started to talk to me about what was on television. She said, uh, did you see what was on Jordan TV last night? I said, I don't speak Arabic, so I don't watch Jordan TV. She said, oh, it was really great. She tells me the story. And I said, well, I'm going to go to the movie this weekend at the Alhambra Theater. I'm going to see a John Wayne flick. That'll tell you how long ago this was. She says, oh, John Wayne, I would love to go to one of those. I said, well, I'll take you. And her mouth dropped open, and she turned white as a ghost. Now, for an olive-skinned Arab, that's a real trick. And she walked away. In her world, you don't date. If someone asks you for a date, they just signed on to the 99 Years to Life plan. The next day, I found out that they were planning my wedding. What I had to do was I had to go to my professor in Arab affairs, and he said, go outside of Damascus Gate, buy a couple of hundred dollars worth of rice and beans and stuff, and go to her family and bring them gifts and say, you can hardly wait for the wedding. I did all of this, and then I had to go to her mother and say, my mother will not let me marry her because she's not an American. I had to say to her mother something, because had I rejected her, she would be single to this day because her first man rejected her. I could have ruined her life and I didn't even care if she went to the movie. And the point was that I learned very quickly that just because a person uh, speaks my language doesn't mean they understand what I'm saying. The Bible translates the words, not the ideas. It translates 
the, uh, things from the life of the people, but very often there's a whole backdrop to the story they think you get. So for the biblical person, you are not what you look like. You're what you do. When, when I um, came up through my collegiate studies, I had two different educations. I had a Jewish education and I had a, a Christian education. In my Christian education, I learned this definition of God. Maybe it matches the one that you know. God is a spirit being possessing intellect, emotion, and will who does things according to his own good pleasure, who therefore brings all things to pass by his active or permissive will in perfect harmony with his attributes. Schaefer's Systematic Theology. The, the problem with it is I, I, I also had a Jewish education in which this is the definition of God in Jewish education. God is a mountain with a cloud at the top. Did you get it? You, you can see the foot of the mountain, what he does, but you cannot see above the cloud who he is. And it's inappropriate for you to try to address that part of him because it's beyond your comprehension. Now the problem is, I come from two worlds. One of them is a biblical world where what I want to do is I want to understand God as he worked in the lives of people. And the other one is I come from a Greco-Roman world where I want to define everything, put it in boxes, and make a theological statement out of it. There are no doctrinal statements for Jews. You don't walk into a synagogue and say, can I see your doctrinal statement? They don't think in those terms. They're not Western, they're Eastern. So when Jesus was approached by John the Baptist's followers in Matthew 11, and they said, are you the Messiah? Or should we look for another? John has sent us, are, are you the one? Jesus said, you go tell John what you have seen that I am doing. The lame walk, the blind see. This is what I'm doing. That's how you'll know who I am. When God defined himself in scripture, he didn't define himself the way I learned it in seminary. The way he defined himself is I am your rock. I am your shepherd. I am your fortress. This is what I do. I'm the God that brought you out of Egypt. You want to know who I am? This is what I do. I'm the rescuing God. That's who I am. I'm known by what I do. Okay? So functionally speaking, there's a second way that God reveals himself to us, and that is in this land, if you look at the history of the Hebrew language, I can say, I have a book. In English, I can say, this is my book. It is not your book, it is mine. It belongs to me. The possessive in the ancient Hebrew is very weak because in the, in the way that people thought, there is to me a book is the way you would translate the way they would say it. The reason is, God made the book and God made me and we're related to each other. I don't own anything at all. I came naked into the world, I'll go naked out of the world. I don't have anything. We define ourselves in the West by possession. This is my house, my car. But for the biblical person, they define themselves by relationship. You, you fly to Amman, Jordan, you get off the plane, you get on a bus, and you turn to the guy and you say, what's your name? And that Arab driver, that's a trick question. Because when he was growing up, he was all the way through his growing up years, son of Mahmoud. And everybody that saw him said, son of Mahmoud, how are you doing? And now he's married and he has a child and he's the father of Abed. And so now the people in his new neighborhood say, hey, father of Abed, how are you doing? His name's Joe, but nobody calls him that. You are who you're related to. So you define yourself not by what you own in the Bible, but by who your relationships are. Think about it. God says, you want to know who I am? I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. This is what I do. You want to know who I am? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is my family. This is who I'm related to. Now listen, when you say I'm a Christian, what you're saying is, do you want to know my God? Watch my life. This is what he's like. You show your relationships, and that identifies you and the rest of your family, and all of you carry together the weight of one testimony. And that's the problem. The biblical world is rooted in a relationship, not an ownership. And God's relationship with me is what should shine through in my life. I also want you to know that the biblical writer doesn't think like you and I think in terms of individual or collective. In the world of the Bible, the good of the many outweighs the good of the one. That is, 
the biblical world is a collective world, and the hero in the Bible is not the one guy who has the cape who radically stands up against the, uh, the, the, the forces of evil. We have this kind of individualist hero story narrative. That comes from our Greco-Roman past, not from our biblical past. In the Bible, it's the one who is part of the collective that brings down everybody together. Do you remember Achan? You remember when he sinned? In Joshua 2 through 6, uh, uh, Joshua takes over. They walk around the city of, uh, of Jericho. The walls fall down, but they were told not to take of the spoils of the land. Achan takes from the spoils of the land. Who died as a result of Achan's sin? Mr. Achan, Mrs. Achan, the kids, the cousins, the aunts, the uncles, the goats, the sheep, the chickens. The tent is burned in the valley of Ahor. And they are plucked out of the sons of Israel forever. Why? Because I am my brother's keeper. We are a unit. And there's a collective mentality about the people. We're going to explore that later on in the tour. We're going to talk more about it. But what's important for you is the rise of the individual. Everything you celebrate in your culture about, about being one man who stands up against the forces of evil, the, the John Wayne, the Superman character, is exactly the opposite of the biblical world value of collective. That comes from our Greco-Roman past, but not from our biblical past. I want to talk more about ways in which the biblical writer uh, thinks differently than you, but I want you to think in form and function, relationship and ownership, and then I want you to think about the collective versus the individual. And that helps us to set the Bible in a setting of a real land. Now we're in ancient Israel and we're along the coastline, the ancient old port at Jaffa, one of the oldest ports we know of in the world. And there in that setting, we'll have the opportunity to watch Peter's vision of the sheet lowering down. Guys, I can give you a litany of verses for every site but you can get those from a book. I'll tell you what the verses are, but what's more important is that you understand the way of thinking. Because the way of thinking is the part you can't get without understanding the world of the Bible. You have different strands that make up who you are. You might not be aware that for all of you, there are some things you get from Egypt. The earliest time we actually find Jaffa written down was something from Ramses II. And uh, Ramses II is about 1200 BC and his in the 1100s. And Ramses actually writes down the word Yafo as a place. Now, the reason I mention him is because some portion of who you are actually comes from an ancient Egyptian stem. The way you tell time, the clock, comes from the ancient Egyptians. The calendar comes from the ancient. In fact, the oldest calendars we have actually come from the seasons set up in a solar calendar from the Egyptians. The cubit, the idea of measuring buildings and standardizing, comes from the ancient Egyptians. And so uh, four fingers, actually like that, makes a palm, and 28 fingers makes a cubit. And that's how they would measure how, how things were built. Uh, seven palms is a cubit. So the ancient biblical kind of standard of measurement comes from that. And it changes halfway through, and we'll talk about that later. But for us, the cubit, the calendar, the clock, current was measured. Everybody who came on their flight today had measuring devices that originated at the Nile and, and with the Egyptians. And so a lot of who you are in background and what works for you, how things come together, actually came from Egypt. But beside that, there are other strands to you. Another strand for you are your biblical students. And as a believer, that one of the basic biblical strands is what comes from the Hebrew scriptures or what comes from God's word. As a result, um, the stories like the story of, of Jonah in chapter one and going down to Jaffa or, or Joppa will be important to us. Joshua 19 says that this uh, became part of the land and was actually taken into a part of the land. So there are many biblical verses that will talk about the place as well. So it'll have a biblical strand. So it has an Egyptian strand, it has a biblical strand, a very important New Testament strand for us. 
where as students of the New Testament, one of those very important will be the story from Acts chapter, end of chapter 9 and chapter 10. We're going to talk more about that story a little bit later because tomorrow I need to build on that story. The point is that the story of the Cornelius story will be founded through the way something startling happens to the message of the gospel. You have to remember for several thousand years, God was approached, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and jo Jacob was approached by coming under the covenant God made with the children of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob, what we today call Jews. At the time of the middle of the book of Acts, there's a startling change where that message opens up, the message of Jesus opens up to non-Jews or what I lovingly call pig-eating pagans. So these will be people who were outside of that ancient covenant, but they will find the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through um, the message, the good news, that they too could become part of the kingdom. So part of your strand is Egyptian, part of it is Hebrew, part of it is Christian, but Christian goes through a major adaptation. The New Testament is written in what language? Greek. So part of your thinking will be very Greek. Let me tell you what the difference will be. Ancient Hebrews were aniconic. Aniconic means against image. They didn't make statues all over the place. So when they had to tell their story, how did they do it? They used words and writing, and some of the earliest writing we have in the world is, is Semitic-based writing or writing that's uh, attached to ancient Hebrew. Because that's the only way they could pass on their story. If I take a flight and go a couple hours west, land in Athens, get out of the airport, go up to the Acropolis, what will I see? Statues everywhere. They're iconic. And the problem is the earliest message of Jesus was actually a Hebrew message with an iconic people. That's why we don't have lots of pictures of Jesus from the time, you know, this is when Jesus was growing up. This is when Jesus, you know, we don't have that stuff. We have that stuff after the message gets carried by Greeks who are iconic, who make pictures out of everything. Now, I said all those words to say, part of you is Egyptian, part of you is Hebrew, part of you is Greek, and when you weave all those together into a modern person, Jaffa is a good place to, to, to start our, our tour because all those layers are here. A couple of hundred feet out into the um, bay is actually the ancient harbor. Now, there weren't, this was not a real impressive harbor. It was a very small harbor, but from the ancient perspective, on the uh, eastern side of the Mediterranean, there were only a couple of places you could harbor in during a storm that was reasonably protected, and this was one of them. There was a coin found behind these buildings down at the bottom, at the base, that you can see when you walk back there. And the coin had on it a ship, and the ship had a four-cornered sheet sail. And that sail, when they, because they couldn't come right up against the K to offload, what they do is they take the yard arm of the sail, take the four-cornered sheet, lay it on the deck, put the cargo in it, use the arm, and drop it down onto the beach. Why is that important? Well, you remember the story is that after the healing of Dorcas, uh, Peter is here at the city. And what's going to happen? Do you remember the story? He's up on the rooftop of Simon the Tanner, and he's hungry, and it's late afternoon, and he sees a sheet coming down from heaven. It's a four-cornered sheet. It looks just like the sail on the coin. And coming down, it's got something in it. What's it got in it, Jake? It's got stuff he can't eat, stuff that didn't come from a kosher deli. And so he hears, arise, take, and eat. He says, no way, it's not kosher. It doesn't follow the biblical guidelines under the legal code for kosher. I never eat in non-kosher delis. Second time, arise, kill and eat. Third time, arise, kill and eat. Why? Because it's Peter and everything Peter does always happens in threes. He's what we call the cranially challenged disciple. Okay? He will be feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He will deny Jesus three times. There's always threes with Peter. It takes him longer than other people. Some of you identify with him? All right. And so what, what is he being told? He's being told that something is happening in the message of his life. Was he being told that food he couldn't eat before, now God says he can eat? No. Because 
The next day, he's going to make his way all the way up to find Cornelius. He walks all the way up. We're going to go all the way to the end there where the tallest tower is sticking up there. We're going to be staying up there near the Yarkon River tonight. He will go that. That is only about uh, one seventh of the distance he walked to that tower. So, go six times more than that after. He walks all the way up to Caesarea. He gets in in Acts chapter 10. He's inside the building where the centurion lives. Cornelius, who's a centurion, the text of chapter 10 says he's a devout man. Do you remember that there were three kinds of people in that period that we're talking about? There were religious Jews who came under the umbrella of the covenant of the God of Abraham through Isaac through Jacob. Then there were Gentiles who didn't know anything about it and ate pig. They didn't care. But then there were people who realized that the message of the God of Abraham was true, but they were born Gentile. So what did they do? They became proselytes. A proselyte is a person who wants to stand under the umbrella of the RJs when he was born outside the umbrella. And so what he does, there are two kinds. There's a proselyte of the gate and a proselyte of righteousness. A proselyte of the gate is a person who doesn't go all the way through the process but is able to go to the gate of the temple of Jerusalem and he can't go all the way inside even though he loves the God of the Hebrews. The Ethiopian eunuch was an example of that. He couldn't go inside because part of him was maimed. So he was disqualified from entry. We'll talk about that later. For Cornelius, he had a problem. As a centurion, he could not swear allegiance to another creed during the 23 years of his service. So even though he agreed with what the temple was saying, he couldn't go through circumcision, which was a way of showing an agreement to a creed. As a result, he could go to the temple and stand outside, but he didn't go all the way in because he wasn't circumcised. He was a devout man, which means he was a proselyte of the gate. And even though he knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and even though he wanted to follow after him, he still needed salvation in the book of Acts. So Cornelius, his prayers are heard by God. You read chapter 10, and by the fourth verse, you already know that an angel has visited him. And so he, God has heard his prayers and says, you need a message you don't have yet. And so God dispatches through another vision, Peter. And he's going to tell you what the vision meant. He's going to say, God has told me that people are not unclean if he says they're not unclean. And so 10 chapters into the book of Acts, something dramatic will happen. And the gospel will open up to a person who otherwise would have been considered unclean. So that turning point will come out of a vision that comes out of this place. The city here obviously has many, many stories, and I, I would take a lot of time to tell you them. But most important thing is in 1799, Napoleon was here. That's why you have these uh, Tantora cannons that are here and uh, in Napoleon standing around. Uh, he made his way here. He visited his troops in the Louvre. There's a picture of Napoleon visiting his troops at Jaffa, and it's actually a painting of the inside of that building down there. Um, St. Peter Church from 1888 is here to mark Peter as a prominent person in the city. But you want to remember here for us, this story extends from here to where we will begin tomorrow at Caesarea, which is really where the story breaks open. Today, we want to talk about the God of the unclean as, as God moves in the life of the Apostle Peter to carry the message of the gospel up to Caesarea by the coast. We'll follow Peter all the way up to the magnificent places in Caesarea where we can see the excavation of what was the capital city of the country for 600 years under the Romans, the, the province of Judea. Together, we'll explore just a little bit of the background of God taking that gospel message into the, the world at large that, that Peter was really grappling with and that Acts 15 became so much the subject of. Caesarea is one of the most magnificent excavations in the country, and we'll spend a little bit of time there looking at the background of how God broke the gospel into the world of the Gentile, the world of the unclean, as we together explore the world of the Bible. We're at Caesarea. We want to start with the 
MTV Complex. Uh, this is a performance theater. We're gonna take a walk through it, show you a little bit about the background of the theater. But to do that, I wanna start off just on the outside over here at a series of statues, okay? We're, we're gonna actually see some monumental architecture of a theater, but there's a reason you're coming here. I don't just take you to places. The, the ancient theater actually started off among the Greeks, and do you remember that the Greek theater had an entire circular orchestra or pit in the bottom? By the Roman period, you can tell if it's Roman because they cut it in half. They had more action and less cerebral attention. In other words, they started off as theater being very cerebral. It was very much about the mind. And then, as it got later, they got more and more action and less and less thought. Anybody see a parallel? <laughs> OK, what I want you to see is we're going to go into the back part of the theater, but actually the upper part of the theater was up here. Half of the theater is gone. Remember that it's always easier to borrow already cut stone than cut new stone. So. After sites are destroyed, people will take the blocks that were used to build buildings and make their building somewhere else. Human erosion. And what I want you to see is that you're only going to see half of the ancient theater. When we go inside, I want to just define for you a little bit about what that theater was about, but I stopped here for a reason. When I show you acanthus leaves of a Corinthian-style capital, where I show you human figures standing here in a toga, what you're looking at is a world that invaded the biblical world. I want you to think of it this way. Everything you're going to enjoy, the symmetry, the look of the building, and even what went on inside of it was from the G world, from the Gentile world. This is an incursion of someone else's world. I, think of it this way. In the Bible, when the Assyrians swept through, and later the Babylonians swept through, and somebody took you over, their God defeated your God, put you in chains, and you went back to their home. And you knew you were whooped. It was Alexander that came up with an opposite view. He said, we're not going to take you away. We're going to infuse our culture, civitas, the word for a city, civilize you. And we're going to do that by injecting our values, our blood, into your lives. Now, if the Jews learned anything from the experience in Babylon, it was never, never, never participate in anything idolatrous again. And as a result, they were a people apart. And during the second temple period, during the period when this was a, a great city, Jews were always those people that qu didn't quite fit into the rest of the world scheme because they didn't want to be civilized in quite the same way. The religious Jewish tenets were, we cannot be everything that the world is. Now, not every rabbi agreed with that. Some of them thought, you know, we got to get along. And so there was a debate that went on. Outside of a Roman bath or outside of a Roman theater, there were often statues of gods. So, for instance, before you went in to compete, there was a god, Nikao, Nike, just do it, right? The Nikao goddess, conquer. And the important thing is before you went into a bath, the goddess, Hygiene. And people would bow to a god before they would go into a, a theater complex or go into a bath complex. So one of the problems was, how do you suppose RJs would bow to a pagan god? Well, not so much. They're not gonna, right? But some enterprising rabbis taught, you know, if your sandal happened to be untied when you were walking up to go in, you could always tie your sandal at the foot of a pagan altar. And there was this whole discussion about how much can we be like them and still be what we're called to be. Today, we call that youth ministry. <laughs> and the subject of youth ministry is entertainment. How much like the world can I be? That has gone on for generations. I want to take you into the entertainment complex of the biblical world and go in through the vomitoria. A vomitorium is not a place you have to walk carefully. It means quick exit, okay? This is a standard theatrical production theater. There are amphitheaters in cities where there's a round theater. There are uh, hippodromes, chariot racing stadiums. This is a performance theater. Let's go on inside.
What you're looking at is a Roman style theater. The actual stage was actually three tiers high. By the way, there's a tier here that you're sitting on, another tier, and another one above it that's gone. I, I want you to notice that there's the orchestra, that's the pit. The, the guys get their name from the pit. The pit was first. And you'll notice that the gray stones are in situ, S-I-T-U. That means in their original position. The brown stone has been supplied by the restoration. It's, it's interesting because the theater itself was excavated in 1960, and when they found it, there was along the front a wall all the way around it. And when you get to Jerash in Jordan, you can still see one there. Now that wall was an echo wall. The point of the echo wall was the speaker was speaking to the crowd and he could be heard, but in order for the actor to know what to be doing, they had to be able to hear the echo that went back to the actor. The orchestra was the place where the speakers in the Greco-Roman theater spoke from. You remember the word for an actor, the person on the stage, the word for actor, Hippocrates. The thespian actor could put on more than one face. So you have four levels to the ancient theater scene or scene or backdrop. You'll have this lower level in which they're standing, and then another level, and then two above it. The top two levels have to do with the gods and goddesses, the bottom two levels have to do with men and women. And it's basically the theater in, in Greco-Roman world is all the same thing. It's how the gods mess with us. That's really what it is. If the scene starts off with a great victory but ends in sort of a tragic happening, it's a tragedy. If it has the opposite loop, it's a comedy. Comedies were appropriate for men but not for women in the Roman period. So it was okay to cry, ladies. It's just not okay to laugh, I guess. I, I'm, I'm just saying. The important thing is this. Think about being a religious Jewish crowd. How do you feel about somebody building a theater that's entire subject is going to be the gods and goddesses of the pagan world introduced into the lifestyle of our children? Think of it this way. When you sit here, remember this is about winning the hearts and minds of our children. Who's gonna win our kids? Let's be honest. In my lifetime, who's done a better job? The local church or Hollywood? It's almost as if, listen, RJ's kids were attracted to places like this. They wanted to come. They wanted to know what the world was all about. But the problem with that was that it really didn't match at all what God wanted them to be. I want you to, I want to introduce this subject through a biblical story if I can. In book of Acts, chapter 10 picks up the story we were talking about yesterday. And so God dispatches through a vision, Peter cut to Jaffa, where we were yesterday, and a sheep falling from heaven. The last thing on Peter's mind would have been, go to Caesarea and tell Gentiles the gospel. What will happen is, he will then hear a knock at the door, and do you remember in the story in Acts 9, how many, by the way, how many soldiers show up at the door? Three, it's a Peter story, they're all three. He comes down and Peter is told that a fellow by the name of Cornelius is asking him to come and meet with him. Now the problem is, what am I gonna do? This guy's a Gentile. So Peter gets up in the morning, walks all the way the distance we just traveled from Jaffa all the way up to Caesarea and when he gets here, what does he do? He comes in in chapter 10 and this is what he says. He says, Cornelius, you know how it is an unlawful thing for a man who is a Jew to come in and keep company with one of another nation, but God has told me that people, he says, are clean or clean. Now, why have you sent for me? And every Christian reading Acts 10 in the background is going, gospel, give him the gospel. But the guy's a Gentile. Salvation is of the Jews. You don't give a Gentile the gospel. Ten chapters into the book of Acts, and Peter's still living a divided world. Why? They came to reach the hearts and minds of our kids, and we don't want to be a part of their world. We're RJs. We're a people apart, and salvation belongs to us and our children. We are the people of covenant and promise. They are the nations. God then opens up by the power of his spirit, and suddenly Cornelius is becoming part of the body of Christ, and right in the middle of the story, then there's this horrendous thing that happens. And Peter just walked into the gates of a Gentile city, and the prophecy that happened in Mark chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 16 got fulfilled in Acts chapter 10. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. If you look at contemporary literature from the time period of Hillel and Shammai, just before the time of Jesus, you'll find that they use 
the term gates of Hades for the gates of a Gentile city. You're Peter, and I'm going to walk you right into the gate of a Gentile city. He always had an objective to reach Gentiles, but it was through on you, Peter, I will build my church and the gates of Gentile cities will not prevail against you. Now, so effective was the early church at reaching into the Gentile world that one rising out of the background of a journey to Damascus is chosen by God, a five foot tall Jew with a big nose and a balding head. His name was Shaul, Saul, or Paul. Do you remember that Paul goes and he preaches the gospel in all kinds of Gentile places? One of them is Corinth, and Corinth has a big theater just like this. And, and 1 Corinthians 13 is a chapter on what? Love. And he says in chapter 13, verse 1, If I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but I have not love, I become two things from a theater. I become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Let me show you the first one, sounding brass. Do you notice along the front staging area there are pits or indentations? Some of them are semicircular and some are square. Now the square ones had statues in them and behind the statues would be a foot lamp to help light the staging. The semicircular cuts are for large jars. Pithos is singular, pithoi is plural. It's a jar, a very large jar. It looks like a, a wine jar almost, but these are jars that were made of brass. They were sounding brasses. So if a god appears in the upper two levels of the skene or the backdrop, the speaker who's down here who speaks for the god grabs the brass jar and calls into the jar by aiming it toward the audience and calling into the jar, I am Zeus. Because you don't want to hear, I am Zeus. You want it to sound like something. Remember the Wizard of Oz? You want it to sound like something. And so a sounding brass was an echoing device that was, that was poised in the front, used by various people in the orchestra to sound like the voice of a god when it's just Herman yelling in a pot. And he says, if I don't have love, even if I speak well, I sound like something substantial, but you know what I am? I'm just a guy yelling in a pot. I'm not real unless you see it in my your life. And then he says, if I don't have love, I become, the word tinkling symbol in the um, King James translation is actually the word for a copper sheet, and they would roll it for the sound of thunder. Now, tinkling symbol doesn't quite capture that for me, but you get the idea. The idea is this, I can sound like a great storm, but you know what I am? I'm just a guy rolling a sheet. That's all I am. Paul was reminding us of something that Jesus had said before. Blessed are those which both say and do these things. In other words, follow the person whose words and life match. You know why? Because remember I told you that to the RJ, to the religious Jew, you are what you do. To the Greeks, a man is known by the philosophy that comes from his lips. In other words, you are what you say. It's what you say that changes the hearts and minds of people. So to the Greeks, someone who had rhetorical skill was a good man. So you spoke well and presented yourself well, and that's what elevated you in government. And people chose you not based on what you had done in your life, but based solidly on your ability to put words together well. Paul cautioned the church, do not choose your leaders based on who speaks well. So when they come on TV and say, I love you, of course they love you. You're sending them checks. The point is you don't know if they're going home and beating their dog. You have no idea what kind of person they are. That's why the church is not just a media communication service. It's a family where people know each other, where their lives are woven together. And that's why you have to be careful. Questions about the theater? This is not a musical theater. A musical theater is an odeon. This is a performance theater. And the orchestra here is our speakers, voices that carry up. Remember that even symmetry that you're seeing here, put a shrub on this side of the door, you put a shrub on that side of the door, that's the difference between you and a biblical person. Solomon could put both his shrubs on one side, none on the other, it would drive you crazy and wouldn't bother him at all. The houses of the Hebrew scriptures period, the first temple period are asymmetrical. 
you get your symmetry from your Roman half. Your biblical half, listen, we think balance is a biblical idea. It's not. God doesn't want you to be balanced. He wants you to be dedicated. That is, by its nature, imbalanced. Balance is a Greco-Roman idea that has come into your life through Homer, not through the Spirit of God in the text. Okay? So we think a lot of things are correct because they're part of who we are. The thing I want you to understand is when you enter the Bible, you leave your world. Stop looking for them to think that what they think is right is what you think is right. You turn on the news and you see a kid out there throwing a rock at a tank. And you say, where's his mother? His mother's going, his mother's going, I cannot stop him from going because I would emasculate that little boy by not allowing him to represent the good of the many. They don't think the way you do. It's not just a different language, it's a different way of thinking. The biblical world is a collective world, it's a tribal world. You think in tribes, not in individuals. And the good of the many outweighs the good of the one. I wanna keep you moving, otherwise you'll get parked here. We're gonna make our way up and around. I just wanna show you a couple of other parts of a palace that were found nearby. This city was nothing more than a little tiny tower and a little garrison in the time period between Malachi and Matthew, just before the time of the birth of Jesus. About 22 years before Jesus is born, this city is rising, and Herod the Great realizes he's got a problem. There are no great ports east of Piraeus in Athens where you can harbor in, so he wants to build a world-class port, and he invents a technology, or rather people invented at the time a technology, of mixing the potash in a specific format to make what we have is now modern cement. So cement begins at Caesarea underwater, they pour cement, and there's poured footings and all of that. This is just before the time of Jesus is rising. Herod the Great is the Herod of that time. Remember, Herod the Great is of Luke chapter 2 fame, kills the babies of Bethlehem. He also did a lot of good stuff. One of the things he did was he built monumental buildings all over the land, including a temple that he'd been working on for an entire generation. And what you have to understand is that Herod the Great knew something. He knew that people who were employed six days a week and are getting a paycheck are too tired to revolt. He also grew up in Rome, and he was a, a seatmate in a desk next to Octavian, who became Caesar Augustus. It's really cool when you're childhood friends with the ruler of the world. So Herod the Great has a lot of very positive things. From a New Testament perspective, he comes off as all bad, but he did a lot of good things as well. And one of them was he built Caesarea as a world-class place, and then he built it to have Olympic-style games here. And he was attracting people to the land here. Now, to do that, he also built some palaces, and I want to take a look at one of them. Remember, one of the things the biblical writer thinks you know is who's on their front page. They don't know you don't live when they live, where they live, how they live. So they don't describe things. They just introduce somebody. This promontory palace that's behind me will include a large area that is open to the sky, a colonnade. This has a long palace that goes all the way out to there where you see the breakers coming in now. And that's because the palace has been eaten by the sea. Some very important things about this palace. This palace was used by the Herodian family from the time of Herod the Great. So it would have gone from Herod the Great, and then in, in the year six, when Jesus is a young child, there is an exchange after Herod dies in four BC, the whole territory of Judea around Jerusalem is moved from Herod uh, the Great to his son Archelaus. The Galilee comes to Herod Antipas, and the Golan, northeast of the Sea of Galilee, will go to Herod Philip. So you'll have another Caesarea called Caesarea Philippi. That'll be Caesarea of Herod Philip, that's elsewhere. You'll have Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the only political ruler Jesus says something about in an overt negative commentary. What did he say? He called him a name. You go tell that fox. It will be Herod Antipas that will imprison his cousin John and behead John. And Jesus has a very tough relationship, a public relationship with Herod Antipas, he'll be the Herod of the Galilee. Here, Herod Archelaus takes over. That's 4 BC. By the year 6 in the Common Era, Jesus is a young child. 
Archelaus has some problems with his Roman government, and as a result, he is deposed, and a series of procurators or governors are put in place. The fifth of those is a fellow by the name of Pontius Pilate. He's also introduced into the New Testament. The important thing about it is this. This will become, it goes from the Herodian family to the place of the procurators of Rome. They're governors. Now, when, you, when you're introduced to these guys in the New Testament, like Pontius Pilate, you ask the question, well, what are these guys all about? Well, this is not the land you want to get. This is not the career move you want to have. And uh, Caesar Augustus, earlier on, had been asked the question, why do you keep these governors where they are for so long? You know, Pontius Pilate was 10 years in the position. He was one of the better ones. Well, Caesar was asked, why do you keep them in that position for so long? And he said, it's like a man who's sitting outside of a, uh, of a city, and uh, he has boils all over his body, and the flies are laying on him. And someone comes up and shoes away the flies. And he says, stop, stop, don't shoo away the flies. The flies that are on me have bit me already and have eaten and are full. If you shoo them away, new flies will only bite me again. Caesar's idea of these guys were they were a bunch of sucking flies. He didn't like them. He didn't want them. And Augustus, when he gave his way to Tiberius, Tiberius was a cranky Caesar. And so they were liked even less. You should see this as the best I can do in a poor career move. And Pontius Pilate would be ruling out of Caesarea. What's he doing in Jerusalem, by the way, during the time of the Passover? Why is he up in Jerusalem? You remember? John chapter 6 says, when Jesus was on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, he fed thousands of people by the sea, and it says, and they wanted to make him king because it was the time of the Passover. Watch that. Passover is when messianic expectations are at their highest, and as a result, it's a time when Pontius Pilate, who's normally here, would be in Jerusalem watching over what's going on because that's when messianic fervor spikes. Remember that the second tallest building in Jerusalem was the temple. The tallest one was the southeast corner of the Tower of the Antonia Fortress. In other words, you can serve God, but you look up to Rome, and we look down on what you're doing. And so he was smart, and he was there for a reason. He's watching out for himself. In 1960, when Antonio Frovo was excavating the area of the theater over here, he found in one of the seat positions a stone that when it was overturned, it had on it the name Pontus Pilatus, Pontius Pilate. I want to show you a copy of that stone that looks exactly like the original that's in a museum. It's found just over there. It's what the people are taking pictures of. Let's go take a look at it. Can you see the word Tiberium here? Us Pilatus, Pilate. Now what's important about this is people found it and they said in 1960, hooray, now we know Pontius Pilate was a real person. That's really dumb, okay? The Bible is self-authenticating. You come to it believing that it is what it says it is or you don't. And the fact that they found the name in stone, here's what I can tell you. In time and case after case, I'm going to later on in this trip lay out the case that archaeology gives great evidence and illustration to the Bible. And if you're a person who believes in its historicity, truly archaeology is going in my direction. At the same time, archaeology isn't designed to prove the Bible. It's, it's designed to illustrate it. Person, listen, even if they come back from the dead, yet they will not believe. Been there, done that, still didn't make them believe. The reason I stop you here is for just this reason. There are a number of believers, when they're young, that come to the place where they think if they can just learn the arguments well enough, they can make it make sense to everyone in the world. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. And you need to understand that even if you could make it absolutely, completely verifiable, the heavens declare His glory and yet they don't believe. It's not about a better argument. It's about a better prayer life. Okay? And so I just pointed out to you, because it's an important stone, it does illustrate something, it does verify something that we should have already known because the text said it. Questions? You okay? Good, I'm going to meet you right over here. Okay, I bring you here because this part was uncovered and restored about uh, two or three years ago. I mean, they knew it was already here, but they were able to, to restore part of an open 
atrium and a series of rooms around it. And this part of the palace was probably a public part. There was private parts and public parts of a palace. I want you to remember that there are two, two parts of the Book of Acts that bump into this city. One of them it helps to illustrate by looking at this chariot racing stadium that's back here. Can you see that there's a large, long, it looks like a theater, but it's actually seating that's much, much longer than that. It's a long chariot racing stadium. And you can just see a couple of side walls to it, just on the inside. What I want you to picture is that part way down to this, there was a dais or a platform. And that this could be a place where you could set something like Acts chapter 12. Do you remember, now we're dealing with Herod Agrippa's grandson, Herod Agrippa I. And Herod Agrippa has the people of Tyre and Sidon coming and begging him for greater revenues in order to rebuild. And so they come and Herod comes out before them and they say what of him when he speaks? What did they say? It's the voice of a God and not of a man. And he is smitten of worms and dies. Well, his palace is here probably the meeting place over there. So it's a good setting for Acts chapter 12. What else was going on in Acts 12? The beginning of the persecution and the beheading of James, right? In Acts chapter 12. So the setting for that is right here. Let me give you another one. Herod Agrippa II, now the great-grandson of Herod the Great. He's now in the palace. And you have a series of procurators that have been traded and some Herodian uh, family members, and they're working together as, as they're trying to rule over this very unruly people. And brought in is this fellow from Tarsus named Shaul, Saul. And you remember he's held by Felix, then by Festus, and then eventually he makes his way to Rome. But in one of his defenses before Herod Agrippa II, maybe within 10 feet or 15 or 20 feet from where I'm standing right now, Paul gave a defense before Herod Agrippa II. And do you remember what Herod Agrippa II said? You almost, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Too bad he wasn't persuaded, because it will be under his hands that a tax revenue failure will become a revolt against Rome, will become the destruction of the Second Temple. There was a moment right there, someplace right here, where all that history could have been different. Thanks again for joining us in our series of Exploring the Lands of the Bible. Today we've had the opportunity to move from Jaffa and along the Via Maris all the way up to the magnificent excavations of Caesarea. We hope you enjoyed this part of our series and we look forward to being with you next time as we explore the lands of the Bible. Next we will be looking at Dr. Randall Smith's presentation of God Answers by Fire. Elijah and the Prophets of Baal, a program filmed on the highest peak of Mount Carmel in Israel, where we can see 1 Kings 18 played out, the story of Elijah and the Prophets of Baal. While looking at all the main elements of this story, we will also be able to look across the Valley of Jezreel, the Valley of Armageddon, where we can see all the way across modern Israel. This is indeed a program not to be missed.